Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. So this started two to three years back. I just experienced a terrible breakup and I started receiving this disturbing phone calls. It started simple. The first call I answered and the person on the other end said how much they missed me. Now, I have a very small circle of friends and I am not on Facebook or in any social media site where I update my photos or my daily activities. And this is important to note. I also know that my ex that I just split up with had nothing to do with the following. The first call, like I said, was simple. They said they missed me. I asked who it was and they said, It's me. Don't you remember? So I hung up and they immediately called back, crying and upset that I was being mean and the caller was clearly an adult male. But they were talking as though they were a very young child, around six. So I hung up again and they didn't call back. Looking back, I should have blocked the number, but as I mentioned, I just got blindsided by a breakup and I wasn't thinking very well. Then, they kept calling. They would call, and if I didn't answer, they left me messages. They were saying how pretty I looked with my blue sweater that day, or that they knew how I took my coffee now, and said that they would remember it for when we finally went out for a drink together. I blocked the number, and they would call me from another one. I answered one day, yelling at them to leave me alone, and I hung up again. When they called back, it wasn't the boy, but his mother. She was very upset and said that I was hurting her boy by not wanting to play and that you could very clearly hear the boy crying and screaming in the background. At this point, it dawned on me that this wasn't a joke, a prank or something of that sort. There was something seriously wrong with these people and they were obviously watching me. For a few weeks following my breakup, I had to live in my car. The entire time I hardly slept, I was terrified, thinking that I would wake up one day and see him standing outside one of my windows. When I finally got a place, he called to congratulate me, and he couldn't wait to come and play. I haven't heard from the people for a year now, but I checked my phone after a very busy work day, and I noticed 10 missed calls, and I'm terrified to check my voicemail. I've reached out to the cops, but they wouldn't do anything since I haven't been explicitly threatened, and I have been advised to just block the calls. I'm going to change my number, but I'm absolutely terrified that the calls will continue even after that, and that it will upset them further. I have posted this, and people have been kind to reach out with advice and tips for me. But I feel like I'm living a horror movie. When I was in second grade, my family took me to a carnival. It's a seasonal event to celebrate something about the town being founded. But I don't really know much of the details. But every year, a carnival opens up near the center of the city for three days. It has all kinds of things, including games, food, rides, fireworks, and entertainers too. So, being seven, this place was like Wonderland to me. I'd gone the year before as well, and I had a great time, so I had been waiting for it all year long. At this year's carnival did not disappoint. The air was filled with the scent of cotton candy and popcorn, and as I explored the colorful attractions, my first priority was to check out all the rides that they had so I could ride them all. But my parents, however, needed to get tickets, so we had to wait in line for them before we could go on any rides. The line was long, but moving fast, 
so we were at the ticket booth in only a few minutes. The rides required a ticket fee for each one, so you'd have to buy tickets in bulk and give some to the ride operator when you entered. My parents had decided to get 40 tickets, thinking that that would be enough, and then we were on our way. The first thing that I wanted to ride was a mini roller coaster. Well, in hindsight, it was just a kiddie ride, but back then, it looked like a lot of fun. Even now, when I'm in my teenage years, it's still a fun ride to go on, but back then it was even better. So, of course, I went on it first and foremost. The ride costed two tickets, which surprised my parents. Apparently, last year it was one ticket per ride, but this year, each ride had a certain cost of tickets per person. So, the 40 that they had bought was a lot smaller than they realized. We continued to go on rides together and have fun until we ran out. And fortunately, there were a lot of rides that we hadn't gone on yet, and there were a lot that I wanted to do again. Seeing that they needed to buy more tickets, my parents left me at the kiddie area of the carnival, a place where you could leave your kid if you needed to go to the bathroom or something and not have to worry about things. That's when I noticed one of the caretakers there. He was dressed as a clown with a painted smile on his face. I noticed him mostly because his eyes were fixated on me. No matter what I was doing, whenever I looked at him, he was staring right back. He kept watching me, his eyes never leaving me as I wandered through the rides and games. The clown then approached me, offering a balloon with a grin. After taking it, he then started to talk to me. Hey, little buddy, want to see something amazing? He whispered, making it sound super secret. My instincts told me that something was off, because he wasn't offering this to everyone, but the clown persisted, insisting that he had a special surprise just a short walk away. In hindsight, my stranger danger alarm should have been going off, but I was just thinking that he was trustworthy since he worked there. So I began to walk with the clown as he held my hand. My heart raced as I saw him motion towards a parked car at the edge of the carnival. Now, I was definitely getting suspicious of this way. That's when I asked him what the secret thing was. He smiled at me and then held a finger to his lips. He said, Well, it wouldn't be a secret if I told everyone. And then continued to walk towards the car, now a bit faster, almost pulling me as I walked beside him. That did it. My stranger danger alarms were finally going off, so I ripped my hand out of his and I tried to get away. But that's when he turned around and grabbed me. I screamed as panic set in. He was now carrying me, kicking and screaming towards his car. He was so much bigger than me and there wasn't much that I could do. But I remember what my parents taught me and I just kept screaming. But those screams were drowned out by the joyful screams and the noise from the carnival. I was crying at this point, not giving up, but I just felt in my soul that it was the end for me. That is, until I saw my dad sprinting towards me. I screamed out for him, and he yelled at the clown. The man turned around to see who called for him, only to be met with a fully grown man tackling him to the ground. I fell to the ground as my mother ran to me, and was holding me close. My father was on top of the clown, hitting him, until a bunch of men in uniforms grabbed my dad and then pulled him off the jester. They put handcuffs on him, and someone was talking on a walkie-talkie. My parents hugged me tightly, ensuring that I was safe now. After some time, a police car came and then took the clown away and then we got into our car and followed them to the police station. What followed was a woman in a police uniform asking me what had happened 
and then assuring me that I was safe. After an hour of that, me and my parents went home, and I slept in my parents' bed that night, both of them holding me closely. After that night, we didn't go to the carnival in the following years, as the memory of that sinister clown served as a chilling reminder that even in a place that should be safe, danger could be quietly masking itself. As the city bus rumbled along its route, I settled into my seat, immersed in the soft hum of conversation around me. Glancing outside the window, I noticed him. At first, nothing seemed wrong, as he was just a man wearing baggy clothing and had very dark circles around his eyes from what I assumed was a lack of sleep. But as I stared at his eyes, his eyes stared back. His gaze lingered on me, and a sense of discomfort crept. That feeling of discomfort only grew as the man boarded the bus and sat beside me. He was trying to strike up a conversation. I tried to be polite and answer in short, curt responses. But then his questioning quickly veered into unwanted territory. He started asking about my dating life, and then asked for my number before I could even open my mouth. Politely, I declined when he asked for my number, but he kept insisting, which was really starting to freak me out. After the third time, I told him that I was not interested at all. His tone then shifted, darkening with frustration and an uneasy feeling gnawed at my gut. Sensing danger, I firmly reiterated my refusal my pulse quickening as he became agitated. I looked around at the other people on the bus, hoping that someone would help me, but they seemed to be looking away, not wanting to get involved. I tried waiting for my stop, but the bus seemed to be moving at a crawl as I wrestled with the decision to leave my seat. As he persisted, my heart pounded and anxiety gripped me. The atmosphere on the bus grew thick with tension, and a few passengers nearby glanced uneasily at the unfolding scene, but still no one said a thing. Summoning courage, I decided to make my move. I rose abruptly, clutching my bag tightly, and I hurried down the aisle. His footsteps echoed behind me, each one a chilling reminder of unwanted attention. Fear surged as I realized that he was following me, and his words escalating into threats. I was one stop away from my own, but I didn't care at that moment. As long as I wasn't here, I wouldn't mind walking an extra five or six minutes. So I pressed the button to notify the bus to stop, and I got out the second the doors opened. But to my dismay, so did he. Panic fueled my steps, and I quickened my pace. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I sprinted towards safety and my breaths ragged. Ducking into alleys, doubling back, I managed to shake him off. Tears welled in my eyes as I managed to make it onto my street. I ran to my house and I fumbled to unlock my front door, relief flooding over me when it finally swung open. Once inside, I locked every door and window my trembling hands dialing the authorities. As I recounted the harrowing encounter, the reassurance and swift response were a lifeline. I shuddered at the realization that danger could lurk in the most ordinary places, but my ordeal ended in safety. The echoes of that night lingered, a chilling reminder of the shadows that sometimes trailed too closely on public transit. I live in a city that is currently going through urban decay in population. Therefore, we have a considerable amount of abandoned houses and also abandoned businesses throughout the city. When I was a teenager, I used to love seeing abandoned buildings 
But now, they're an eyesore and attract a lot of dangerous people to the city. That, and YouTubers and TikTokers all looking for clout and to profit off showing off the area. Sorry, but it really makes me mad when it happens, especially when the rich kids come in with no self-awareness or respect for anyone else. When I go for a walk at nighttime, I make sure I'm strapped and I take my dog with me. Wolfie is a mixed breed. He looks angry and vicious, has a mean scary bark and will defend me. But when it comes to his family, he is so loving and just a giant goofball. I really love Wolfie. It was dark outside and most people went into their homes. People don't like going out late at night. I live with my extended family in one small home, so I will go crazy if I don't get out of the house. So I put my dog's leash on and then we set out. Wherever you go out at night, always make sure that you're aware of your surroundings. I never have pods in when I'm out because I want to hear if someone is getting close. I noticed there was a light in one of the abandoned houses. Homeless people go in them sometimes. Some of them just want to get off the streets and mind their own business, while the others destroy them, do drugs, and otherwise fuck things up for everyone else. Instinctively, I began to walk just a little faster. Wolfie seemed to notice my change in mood. There were a couple of streetlights that were out of commission. Naturally, the city wasn't doing their damn job to fix it. I wasn't going to walk where I couldn't see, so I tried to subtly turn around to walk back the way I came when I heard someone call out to me. Now, there were no way I was going to run or show signs that I was scared, so I just kept walking. Hey, bitch! The voice was loud this time. My dog turned around and started barking and snarling, and my hand went to rest on the top of my gun. I didn't say anything. I didn't need to say anything. He stopped and put his hands up and instantly began to back off before he ran off. If he had been a crack addict or something, there is a chance that he still would have charged at me. I didn't want to push my luck, so I made my way home. Still, with a feeling that I was being watched and even followed. Not that I saw anyone, though. My dog was alert, and I knew that he was going to keep me safe. Normally, I go out for a walk every day, but the day after, I found myself avoiding it. But on the second day, I knew that I had to get out of there and face the growing anxiety head on. I took Wolfie out with me, and I took my gun again. The house with the light on was completely dark this time, with no sign that anyone was in there. I figured that the homeless man must have moved on. I avoided the parts where I couldn't see, but from a space between two homes, I heard someone calling out for help. I stopped. It was dark down there, and Wolfie looked agitated. A part of me wanted to go and help whoever it was, but this was a dangerous city, and I needed to protect myself. I wanted to call out to ask what was wrong, but my gut instinct told me to get out of there. And so I did. I made my way home, and I called the police when I got there to tell them all that I saw and heard. They told me that I was smart not going to see what was wrong. I asked them to go and see what it was, but since there wasn't a crime, they weren't too concerned by it. As expected, there was a reason. A neighbor left the house and went to see what the problem was. She was robbed, but fortunately managed to get away before something worse happened to her. Her son came home from work and found her in time. I'm not sure of all the details about it, but she is okay and alive. Some people say that they were going to kill her, while others were saying that they were working for a human trafficking ring. 
I don't know what would have happened if I wasn't aware of the situation. I might not be here today. My boyfriend was driving and I was sitting in the passenger seat. It was nighttime and we were traveling across the state to stay at my parents' place for a while. Our rent got too expensive and we needed somewhere else to stay so we could save up to get our own place. Not really relevant to the story, but it provides some background. We were casually listening to the radio and chatting between ourselves when it started to rain. Okay, this wasn't too bad. Driving in the rain wasn't a big deal. We had the headlights on and drove through the country road. Unfortunately, our trip slowed down when my boyfriend couldn't see anymore. We stopped at one of those 24-hour service stations that had warm food inside of it. We went in, we sat inside, ate, and other than the clerk there, there were no other customers in there with us. But then a beat-up looking truck drove into a parking spot. A scruffy, wet-looking man with dirty clothes came into the service station. We noticed the smell. A musty, foul, and almost fishy odor hung in the air. Maybe he was a fisherman. Or just, maybe didn't have any decent hygiene. We tried to be polite and didn't end up looking at him. He walked around looking at the items, and then he came and looked at us. Whenever we would look at him, he would drop his gaze and then look elsewhere. I noticed him doing this a couple of times. I figured he wanted to borrow some change or something, so I just ignored him. My boyfriend and I forgot that he was there during our conversation, and finally we finished our food and the rain was beginning to ease. So we went out and got in the car and then drove off. We noticed some headlights driving behind us. My boyfriend recognized it, that it was the same man at the service station. And since we were driving on the highway, we didn't think too much of it. He was probably just headed toward the same place we were. It was only when we drove into his parents' suburb that that beat-up looking truck followed us. We pulled over by the side of the road, and then he did the same. He didn't get out of the car, though. He just sat and stared at us with the headlights still on. My boyfriend was going to get out, but I grabbed his arm and I told him not to. We didn't know if he had a gun or some other weapon with him, and I didn't want him to get hurt. He stayed in the car with me, and after a while, we drove off. I wasn't surprised when I saw those same damn headlights following us in the rain. I really didn't like this. We drove around for a while, but we couldn't speed up because we didn't want to crash. It's hard to explain, but he just seemed to disappear. We saw the headlights, and then we didn't. I don't know if it was just a weird glitch that happened, whether he drove off or what happened, it's a mystery. Maybe people in the comments section could help me work out what happened. So we spent time at my parents' place and we had to go get some extra blankets and towels for the house. We then noticed the missing poster. And the guy on the photo was him. The driver who was following us. He looked cleaner though, healthier and they said there were grave concerns for his health. We reported it to the police, but there were still no leads. The posters for him are still up around town and through the small town gossip. I heard that his truck was stolen and not seen again. I think it's one of those stories where there is some truth to them. There were some other reports of him being seen, but he was a ghost. I don't think that's the case, though and it is in bad taste to say that he is a ghost or to make bullshit stories about it. I don't know if it was actually him or not, 
Maybe he was staring at us because he wanted help or something. I feel bad if we were his last chance. But we equally didn't want to get hurt either. It sucks how you have to be careful about who you help because some people are crazy or predatory. But you gotta do what you need to do. I don't know if he was ever found or if he remains as a missing person. I think it wouldn't have been anywhere as unsettling if it wasn't raining at that time. The thick rain made it difficult to see, and we had to go slower unless we wanted to avoid the risk of a car accident. I'm not really sure how to end this. I'm a 22-year-old female, and I was on vacation in San Antonio with a friend for New Year. In retrospect, I would have picked anywhere else to celebrate, but I had never been to San Antonio before, so I thought that it would be cool. When we pull up to the place, it's very obvious that it's not in a great neighborhood, but it was extremely cheap and also within walking distance to the river walk. I'm no stranger to questionable neighborhoods, so I wasn't too concerned about the area as it was very quiet. On the day of New Year's Eve, my friend got food poisoning and asked me to get some stuff from the gas station down the road. I wasn't comfortable taking the truck and since it was only an 8 minute walk, I started heading out. I got to the gas station with no problem, but they didn't have Pedialyte so I started walking to another gas station that was only 5 minutes away. And this is where it gets sketchy. I'm halfway to the next gas station and I notice that there's two homeless guys walking around outside their tents next to the street that I'm on. Originally, I was going to walk right past them and just pay them no mind. But when I got closer, I could tell that they noticed me and they were staring at me hard. I'm 5'5", five five, not super athletic, pretty strong, but I'm not taking my chances with two grown men. Instead of going straight past them, I just turned the corner. I assumed that they would go about their business and just leave me alone. But I hear one of them say, Hey, Randy, come over here. And I glance behind me and I see three men now following me. They are far enough away where I'm not worried, but I'm extremely cautious. I glance behind me again after a few minutes. They're hunched over and huddled up, like they're trying to sneak up on me, and they're much closer this time. I make the smart decision to say fuck the Pedialyte, and I just round the corner back towards our place. I'm maybe one to two blocks away when I check behind me again, and they have also rounded the corner and are now walking quickly. Well, I start booking it, and I hear the men behind me yelling at me. I didn't look back this time, but I could hear shuffling feet breaking into a run. Thankfully, I made it inside before they could see where I went. I peeked out of the peephole in the door, and I watched in horror as these three men came barreling around the corner and started frantically looking around for me. They're arguing and then pointing around, but eventually they went away. If I wasn't so alert, I shuddered to think what would have happened, and no, I did not get the Pedialyte, I had to get it delivered. I'm in the process of applying for a new job and started contacting various places to see if they were hiring and also sending in my resume. About three weeks ago, I got a text from a director saying that texting would be easier to keep in touch about filling out my application and also setting up interviews. I ended up meeting him twice about two weeks ago, one to see the facility and two for an interview. Since then, 
Heens passively said things, such as how pretty I am and that I would be a perfect fit and etc. But there's no actual updates on the job. He also tried asking me out multiple times, but he tries to make it seem like we would be talking about the job. I've tried not to reply as much as possible, and I have been ignoring him because I don't want to work with someone like that. Well, yesterday, he messaged me to tell me that he was sending flowers to my apartment building. I never gave him my address directly, but it was on my application. I said thanks, and then I ignored him because I was freaking out. And today, he asked if we could meet up for coffee because he's in my neighborhood. I didn't respond to him. About two hours later, I took my dog for a walk and I passed by a coffee shop that is two streets over from my apartment building. And he was sitting in a booth right next to the window. We didn't make direct eye contact and I honestly couldn't tell exactly if it was him. But I kept walking and he almost immediately texted me asking if that was me that he just saw and if I wanted to come back to the coffee shop. I still didn't reply. I live in a huge city, so what are the chances that he was at the coffee shop in my neighborhood that was close to my apartment just by chance? Was he just waiting for my response that whole time? Or am I just being paranoid about being stalked? Please, let me know your thoughts about this. I encountered this one on the 2nd of January, a couple of days ago when I was asleep in my room. I'm an 18-year-old female, living in Singapore with my parents. I'm sorry if this is pretty long, but I would appreciate if you take your time in listening and commenting your thoughts about it. In my family, it's only me, my mom who is 38, and my stepdad who is 40 living in a small apartment. I have my own bedroom as I'm an only child. My parents took the smaller room and I have the master bedroom, which has a big window that is facing the back of our house. For my bedroom, there's a big space outside our windows that's between every apartment unit over here, so there's no way that someone would unintentionally stand near my window you have to walk in and go for a few turns before coming in here. Well, I eventually fell asleep at around 11pm and I forgot to close my blackout curtains for my window. Exactly at 1.23am, I checked the time when I accidentally woke up. I heard three loud knocks on my room window, which eventually woke me up as I'm a very light sleeper. At where I'm sleeping, my window is on the right corner and I can see whatever shadow that gets through it at day or even night. On that night, I didn't switch on any of my lights, so it was total darkness, except for my table lamp that was shining at me at the highest brightness. At first, I was sleeping while facing my room door, which was on my left, so I had an automatic response to turn my head and look at what's knocking on my window. And to my surprise, I saw a silhouette of a man's head that was clearly visible on my window. I had goosebumps and I froze because I was unsure of what to do as the curtains wide open, so obviously, that man can see me through my window. And despite my parents' room being right next to mine, I went into shock and I had to call my mom to help me check if I was just tripping and to also close my curtains for me. I told her what I saw afterwards, and in the end, she advised me to sleep in the living room for the meantime to calm myself down. I felt really uneasy that night, and I couldn't go back to sleep. So I stayed awake the same night. I heard three more knocks coming from my bedroom at 3 a.m., which, of course, I had to assume that it came from the window. And before this happened, 
My curtains were already closed and blocking my window's view, so I thought that it would be fine for me to go ahead and get a little look on who or what knocked on my window. The only difference is that this time, the knock was louder but slower, like the ones you would experience as if you're in an old haunted house. I come to think about it until now, I wish I just stayed curious and stayed in my living room. I had my face and hand holding onto the window since I had to get a closer and clearer look since I didn't see a silhouette when I was standing from a distance from the window and me still being paranoid from what happened hours before. I saw a man who is around 180 centimeters plus standing outside my room window, about 4 meters apart, standing and staring straight at me who was currently frozen in place at the window when I saw him. He was wearing gray long pants and a black t-shirt and really, really pale skin. It looked as if he had no expression when he saw me. By this time, I wasn't really sure if it was the same man that stood outside at around 1.30 a.m. As much as I was tired that night, I knew that I wasn't hearing things or just having hallucinations. I was perfectly wide awake when I saw that man. The moral of the story is always check your windows before falling asleep, and it's best to get a blackout curtain to protect yourself. Of course, guard your window with protective measures. The story happened about a year and a half ago when I was around 19, and it will always, always stay with me as it has definitely given me PTSD and a greater fear of men since it happened. I had just moved into a college apartment with friends, only finding out a few months later that there was improper ventilation leading to humidity and mold inside the bathrooms and other spaces. Maintenance or management would proceed to label it as discoloration and to just leave the windows open or buy a fan and stop taking steamy showers. This was hilarious since none of us enjoy hot showers and take at most a lukewarm one. This advice was given after this event and ignoring my reports that I made to law enforcement and the main landlord. However, we were barely adults and had never had to deal with such a terrible mold issue. We were buying sprays and cleaning the ceilings, crevices, the tub, and etc., constantly in fear of mold inhalation. We found that this, and leaving our window open with a mosquito screen locked, helped the most. The small window, the size of an average human head, about nine feet off the ground, facing the other apartment's window, was of no concern to us when we were using the bathroom. After all, we had walked outside and made sure no one could easily look in. Of course, I could not predict what could come next. On our front porch, we had some pumpkins and a single white chair that was barely used this night, and this will be important later. One night, after airing out the humid bathroom after a shower, I wished my roommate goodnight at around 2 a.m. before going to use the toilet. I was wearing the baggiest shirt ever, thankfully, so nothing was exposed while doing so. But I nonchalantly flush and I go to wash my hands while glancing to the left where the window was ajar as usual. And that's when I saw it. In the pitch blackness of night, contrast to the blaring, cheap bathroom lights, there was a pale round orb with a mop of dark hair atop of it. I still cannot explain the feeling that I had, almost like someone is whispering to you just audibly enough where you need a second or two to register what they had just said. That pause, and a quick turn to the right, and then a quick spin right back for the window, I saw a white arm leaning into the mosquito screen for support 
before whisking away and down and out of the frame. It moved, and without another thought, I found myself running for the front door, yelling, Someone was looking into the bathroom! A few times to my roommate in the living area. On a side note, do not ever chase after a perp, no matter what the case, even if it's hard with adrenaline running through you in this case is. I heard her yelling back while I found myself already at the bottom of the window outside, now hearing scuffling through the wood chips outside our apartment building. It was clearly the sound of someone escaping through the shadows, no mistaking it. I could not see anyone through the shitty trees that were planted, and stopped as I could not pinpoint where exactly he ran. I thought about yelling some cheap insult or a threat to scare him, but I found myself feeling waves of shock silence me. I ran past my roommate, grabbing my phone from inside and calling my mother, who advised me to call a non-emergency number in my town. And I did so, while sitting on the patio with my self-defense items and also with my roommate. The lady that answered was annoyed and she sounded like she did not believe me no matter what I said to her because I did not get a good look at him. She simply sighed and said the police will be over to survey the complex a few times and then she hung up. My roommate and I were in shock, just sitting there in silence. We discussed in detail what just happened when we saw a cop car driving around an apartment complex one block away, then immediately drive off after one minute. Obviously, this left me feeling defeated more than before. I got angry, I stood up, and I examined the area outside my window myself. I saw no footprints or markings that were unnatural, and even tried standing on the electric boxes outside to see if I could look inside. But not only were the boxes too narrow for someone any bigger than myself, as I have a small shoe size compared to the average man, but this will only allow for a view of half of the ceiling for a second or two before falling off. This was not how he looked in. I knew from the way he had struggled to get down. I saw enough of his torso to determine that he was around five foot eight and had to have some other way to easily be staring in like he had. It was also odd that he had darted off without me seeing him, and only hearing him because there are sensors placed around the complex, with one right by our bathroom window. When triggered, they display a bright and blinding light that lights up the whole back area and the side of our apartment where this occurred. I brainstormed for a second before darting off past it. It didn't go off. When I walked back to my roommate, that's when it did. I tested this twice over, and it had the same results. It only worked when you were not running past it. I felt a sense of relief, only to the fact that I was not so crazy. I was the only witness to this, but I could tell that my roommate believed me. We headed back to our front door, talking about what we would do if he would come back. Obviously, we would be keeping our window closed now, but we had to give him just desserts, we thought, in our exhausted and overwhelmed teen heads. That was when I joked about grabbing one of our pumpkins and hitting him over the head with it when I stopped in my tracks. Hey, didn't we have a chair there? I ask. The white patio chair was gone. We looked around, and it was nowhere to be found. I gasped, and I almost fell to my knees. That's how he did it. My roommate hurriedly looked through her phone, and she remembered having a food order earlier that day with a photo confirmation. Approximately four hours earlier, there it was. The bag at our door that was sitting directly on a white chair next to our pumpkins. The same chair. I immediately posted to social media sites asking for help finding this distinct chair 
thinking that it would be the last hope we could find in finding this pale-faced creep. Not only had he been staring into our bathroom for God knows how long, but he had surveyed our front door area and possibly looked in through the windows here as well, although the blinds were closed. Our apartment made sure to install the worst kind of blinds that you can never fully close, so if anyone wants to look in, even into your bedroom, they would just have to crouch down a little bit. We felt disgusted and shocked, and I left three voice messages with the apartment complex the next day, informing them of the incident and about the issues with their ventilation. And as you expected, no one ever got back to me, which was weird since they always did previously. I felt like everyone failed me in this moment. I did everything that I could, but I never received any closure or solace. In fact, I received tips from other college girls in the same area, telling me of very similar experiences where they sometimes had the full view of a greasy older man even touching himself to them. Recently, this past few months too, there have been numerous sexual assaults as well as peeping toms in the same area of our apartments. Funnily enough, the clear descriptions match what glimpse I got of him. But still, the police never caught anyone in connection to these cases. I never viewed this area as a bad area, and I always took every precaution that I could, but I still felt at fault now. I know that I am not, but I hope everyone living in a similar situation makes sure to at least close their shower curtains to shield yourself or close their windows when the bathroom is in use at all. I wish I could buy security cameras, but I know management would file a complaint about it. I am moving out soon, so this is the only solace I have of getting out of there and leaving this all behind me. And to the greasy, stinky, pale pervert who I stared eye to eye with all that time ago, I hope that we never meet again for your sake. Hello friends, I've been a lurker of this subreddit for a long long time now and I figured that it was high time that I shared some of my spoopy tales. First and foremost, my name's Mikey. I'm in my 20s and this story happened when I was still a munchkin, below the age of 12. You'll have to excuse how overly sarcastic the story may seem. It's still scary to talk about and humor is my defense mechanism. Anyway, when I was still knee-high, me and my grandmother, whom I'll call Tilly, used to go on yearly road trips either across our own country or the one next to ours. We lived relatively close to the border. Well, on this particular occasion, we decided to travel across our neighboring country Let's call my home Country A and the neighboring one Country B. My grandmother had a friend in the more yeehaw part of Country B that she hadn't seen in a minute, and after some planning, they figured out the best time for the two of us to make our trip. I was excited when my grandmother first told me about the trip. I had no idea where we were going, but the idea of going on a road trip with Gram Gram was so damn exciting, I could hardly contain myself. Fast forward a few months, and we finally hop in the car and head off on our merry way. The trip would take approximately a week, and my grandmother wanted to see all the neat stuff along the way, and traveling with a child such as myself required a lot of pit stops. I wasn't necessarily a bad traveling companion, I just had a small bladder. Well anyway, we were on the last stretch of the trip when my grandmother had to pull into a gas station to fill up and we were practically running on fumes. And I really had to go to the bathroom too. We pulled into this middle of nowhere gas station 
and after my grandmother had filled up the car, we then hurried inside so I could empty my bladder. The moment that we walked inside, all the alarm bells in my tiny brain went off. I had no idea why I was feeling the way that I was up until I set my eyes on the clerk. Now, I'm not usually one to judge a person by how they present themselves, but old boy looked like he walked straight out of a serial killer documentary, and that's what I'll be calling him from here on out. Currently, we're smack down in the center of Yeehaw territory, in the middle of nowhere, and this man looks like he should be selling you high-end cars, not working at a rundown gas station. Old boy was giving me all kinds of bad vibes. I really don't know how to explain it other than that. Worse still, he was already smiling a little too widely when he spotted my grandmother. She was petite, blonde, and beautiful. Granted, I'm a bit biased. She is my grandma, you know. However, when he saw me, you could have sworn he was looking at Sunday dinner. Somehow, his already very wide grin only grew, and remembering it, even to this day, gives me the heebie-jeebies. Thankfully, Graham Graham could sense a disturbance in the forest and shielded me from his predatory gaze. She paid for the gas and asked for the key to the washroom, which she took his sweet-ass time getting. She walked with me to the bathroom, which was disgusting by the way, and I quickly did my business. And then we returned the key with great reluctance. Here's where things get progressively worse. When we were piling back into the car, old boy closed down the shop and got into his car. It doesn't seem too weird, right? Sure, he was super creepy, but he hasn't done anything too odd yet. Now, technically, we had two days left on the trip. My grandma would drive in increments, four hours on the road, an hour off to explore, and then fill up and etc. Then we would find an inn or a motel and spend the night there. We traveled about eight hours a day before turning in for the night. Well, when we left the gas station, old boy followed us for, I shit you not, the rest of the trip. At first, we assumed that he was heading in our general direction. It was just the one road after all. But after the third turn off, an old boy was still tailing us. My grandmother finally realized that we were being followed. This man proceeded to follow us for, I wish I were joking, 12 hours. And my grandmother refused to stop driving unless it was absolutely imperative. For anyone wondering why she didn't just call for help or why she didn't pull into a police station, don't worry, you're not the only one. To be perfectly fair to my grandmother, she didn't have a phone, and despite somewhat knowing where she was, it was still unknown territory. She wanted to get to familiar surroundings so there wasn't the risk of getting lost. We finally made it to the city where her friend resided, and that's when we pulled into a police station. The mad lad pulled up next to our car just as we headed inside the building, and he watched us. I don't know what old boy was taking, but he sat there while my grandma talked with a lovely lady at the desk. Thankfully, the cops handled the creepy man with ease, but I will never forget the damn smile that never left his face while he was being escorted away. Needless to say, that was the last time that we road trip to Country B and one of the last times that we actually took a road trip in general. Hello, I work for Gloria Jeans. It is a coffee place here in Australia that sounds a lot like Starbucks. That being said, I've never actually been to a Starbucks. Anyway, the chain is fairly popular around Australia. I've worked here for about two years, 
and started when I went to university studying women's studies. I'm still working at Gloria Jeans because the cost of living in Australia is so damn expensive, so I need it as a side job. Basically, I really need this job to help me stay afloat. I was serving in the morning rush of people who were waiting with various degrees of patience for their morning coffee. When I noticed a woman who I hadn't seen before, I asked her for her order and to be honest, I don't remember what it was or her name. It's hard to remember it all. The morning rush was over and she was still there. There was nothing weird about her and she didn't give us any trouble like our Karen or Darren characters would. I asked her if she was okay and she asked me how I was doing. I replied and I said I was fine too. Just the morning rush can be intense. She asked if she could ask me a few questions, and since it was quiet, and the management likes when we have a good rapport with customers, I agreed with her. She asked if I had a partner, and I said no, not at the moment. I swear, her face lit up. So far, nothing super weird. I apologized to her, and I told her that I wasn't looking, and she didn't look phased at all. Each day afterward, she showed up and wanted to speak with me. It was getting really annoying. She would wait there all day and follow me when I had my time off work. I told her that I was on a break and I needed space to eat and rest. And she sat at the table across from me, staring and eating her food. She hadn't done anything violent, just really, really weird. I asked her to be left alone she sulked and got up and then left, but she was back again the next day. I talked to my manager about it, and he didn't really take me seriously. I had to take my car into the repair shop to get it fixed, so I had to catch the bus instead. I hate taking public transport, but it was either that or an Uber. I wanted to save up some cash, so I just took the bus. Anyway... She was on the same bus, and she also got off at my stop. I had to sneak through different apartment blocks to hide from her, so she wouldn't know where I lived. I told my manager what happened, and finally he asked her to leave the store. I tried ignoring her. One day, I had to work late, and I was walking out to where I parked my car. Two things were wrong. She was sitting on my car, and she was waiting for me by my car. I said, Hey, what the hell are you doing? And she said that she had been waiting for me, and that she had missed me. I told her to leave me alone, and I drove home. This is where I made a big mistake. I didn't realize that she put an air tag on my car and then found out my address. Over the next couple of months, I was sure someone was looking through my windows. One of my plants was stolen. I'm not sure if it was her or not. I also noticed strange little bottles on my front step. It was incredibly strange. I didn't see her at my house until one day that I realized that I forgot to take the bins out. So I did that and then came back inside, and I closed and locked the door. Then I came back to see her, sitting in my living room. I let out a scream when I saw her, and a maniacal grin on her face, and she told me that she had been waiting so long for this. I ran to my phone, and I called the cops while she tried to take the phone from me, screaming at the top of her lungs that she loved me, and that I was hers. I was backed up into the kitchen when she grabbed one of the knives, threatening me with it, and I punched her to get her away from me. This crazy bitch then started slicing into her own arms, and it was the most insane thing that I have ever seen in my life. My neighbors heard the screaming, and the police and the ambulance came to take her away. She had lost a lot of blood, and surprisingly... 
cops got her to drop the knife. I don't know what I would have done if they were forced to kill her in my home. She was arrested, and I think she was sent to a mental health facility. I hope she's getting the help that she needs, but I'm just happy to be done with it. Okay, so for context, I live in a pretty rural area. We live on the outskirts of our town, which already is small compared to the other populations of other towns in California. We're about 15 minutes from the small town and 40 minutes from the main city. We live down a dirt road with some neighbors. Our house has no other fences attached to ours, and on two sides of the house is only fields and dirt roads one side having a single house in the field. The other two sides have a couple neighbors down the other roads, and nobody really interacts out here, except my dad talking to the two of them sometimes. I was probably 12 when this happened. I had low self-esteem, and I wanted to start exercising more. I had been enrolled in a charter school due to bullying. Yes, that played into my self-esteem, but let's get on with the story. So I didn't really have many ways of exercise besides a treadmill that we owned. I wanted to start getting fresh air too, so my mom suggested that since we live out here, that it would be peaceful to take walks down the back dirt road. I agreed, even though I was stubborn about it half the time. But we began walking and usually would go in the mid to late afternoon when it would start cooling down outside, but it was still light. In case it got dark, we took our flashlight too. Being out here, it was notorious for stray dogs to sometimes make their way out of here, and we would carry pepper spray and a mini bat just in case one got vicious. However, a dog will play into the story. One day, me and my mom decided to go on a walk in the late afternoon, so we took off and started walking down the road. When you walk about a quarter of a mile down the road, you start to come towards a little cross section. There's a road going to the left to the highway and a road going right to the neighbor's house, or the road goes straight down to a utility road. Me and my mom discussed walking down the utility road to get a good walk since it went on for a while. When we started getting to the crossroads, this dog came out of literally nowhere. We were looking at it, and it was in the center of the road staring at us. Me and my mom looked at it, and my mom said that she got this feeling in her stomach that we needed to turn around and then walk home. So she grabbed my arm and then started leading me back home. We were in the midst of walking when she looks ahead and stops to stare at something. I ask what she's looking at and then she points. A white car pulled up to our fence and quickly backed up and shot down the road on the side of our house. Mind you, nobody ever goes down this road except one old man that we know. Anyone else who does usually is scoping out my dad's tools to steal them. My mom said that she felt a bit uneasy because of it and then pulled me to the edge of the dirt road, almost into the field. The car had then driven to the highway and left. Or so we thought. We continued walking back to our house when this car comes back and drives down the road that we are walking alongside. I caught a glimpse and it was this smaller white car with black tinted windows that you couldn't see through. My mom instantly got a feeling of impending doom and then pulled me into the field, not too far, but far enough. We kept walking through the field towards our house, getting closer now. When this car comes back down the road, my mom stops me in my tracks to see what the car is doing and it drives back to our house and starts driving around it super fast. 
for context, we have a random road and area that goes around our yard and our property. My mom waits until the car drives back down the side of the road and she tells me when we need to start running. So that's what we did. We started running through the field, getting to one of the little sections near my yard. The car comes back and then drives down the road trying to cut us off. Me and my mom are panicking at this point and we have no idea who this is and why they're acting like this. The car circles around again and my mom drags me further. We were going to run down into the ditch. We get into the ditch and the car comes back around and pulls to the edge of the ditch where we were. The front of the car was facing us and all I could think about was if it drove down, it would hit me and my mom and probably kill us. My mom quickly put her arm in front of me and stood dead still while I was literally horrified and dropped our flashlight and I think my water bottle too. The car was getting ready to drive down where we were and then suddenly, they backed up and drove around the yard, going back down the side road to the highway. Me and my mom felt like our souls left and then she tells me to run, to not look back and to get to the front gate. I run up the ditch, feeling my heart pounding. I run around the yard and towards the front gate, flinging it open, and I started running towards the front door. I didn't hear my mom behind me. I was running to the door to open it, and right when I looked over, I saw the car coming back down the side road. I ran into the house, trying to catch my breath. I saw the car drive down the road, and I didn't see my mom, so I was panicking. I ran towards the sliding glass door, and suddenly, my mom comes running towards it, flings it open, running inside and locking it. She then tells me to go lock the front door while I try to catch my breath, and I tell her that I was scared because I had no idea where she was. She went to chug some water from the fridge, and she told me that when I was running, she was trying to shut the front gate when she noticed the car coming back down the road. She said she knew she wouldn't have time to follow me to the door, so she ran behind my sister's car to stay out of view of the car. And when it drove back down the road, she took the opportunity to run to the back door since it was closer to my sister's car. It's crazy to think that if we hadn't seen that dog standing there in the road, and then decided to turn back, that we may have been run down. Fortunately, we haven't seen the car again, and think it may have just been some crazy person or druggie who just so happened to come down our road that day. I've had my fair share of dealing with creeps and weirdos in life. I just reposted on this subreddit about an encounter with a potentially dangerous racist or a pervert in Atlanta, Georgia. Some encounters are not as serious, but creepy nonetheless. A few years ago, when I was living in Los Angeles, California, I lived next door to a mortuary. Tons of creepy energy from here alone. And right behind my house was a halfway house full of ex-cons, drug addicts, alcoholics, and etc. The house was two stories and overlooked my backyard. They would play loud rock music early in the mornings and some of them would sit in the window upstairs to smoke. There was one guy in particular who smoked a lot. Almost every other hour, I would see him taking drag after drag from his cigarette. He would be watching my backyard intently. He looked sort of young, maybe early 30s. He had greasy black hair that I guess he attempted to cut and tidy up somewhat and scabs or marks all over his colorless face. He wore black thick rimmed glasses. He had a deranged, psychotic sort of energy but he wasn't aggressive. It's kind of hard to describe. I'm not one to judge anyone in his position, but the way he would always watch my house 
and anyone that would come outside to the backyard. It was disturbing to say the least. After a while, I would stop coming out back and he would always be up there, wild and blinking eyes, watching me as I walked around. He never spoke or made a sound, he just watched. One day, I was watching movies with my family in the living room. The living room of that house led into the backyard, and there was a window behind one of our couches that faced directly outside. We had the blinds and the window open. It was a warm night sometime in the summer. I was sitting on the couch with the window directly behind me, and I think I heard something outside. I'm not really sure, but for some reason, I turned around to look out of the window. And there he was, up in his window, looking right at me. He was shirtless, and I could see scabs all over his upper torso. His eyes were wider than normal, and they had a sick, perverted look to them. There was no cigarette or smoke that I could see, and his hands were down and out of view. I think he was even nodding his head a little bit. We stared at each other for a short few seconds before I abruptly closed the blinds and silently continued to watch the movie. I don't think my family noticed him. I had trouble sleeping that night, knowing that he was still over there. Luckily, I don't live in that neighborhood anymore. I grew up in the 1990s, born in the late 80s, and I remember getting my first bike and starting to explore the area in which I grew up in, upstate New York. Where I grew up is much different now in the 90s. It was more rural with clusters of neighborhoods here and there. I lived near an old landfill, and the main road connected a lot of semis down to some factories in a neighboring town that was like a five-minute bike ride. We also had an old Baptist church that was founded by an eccentric former hippie who was really good to the community. My dad, who was a very serious drinker, loved to fish and hunt and etc. with his friend because it gave him an excuse to drink and kill something. But he ended up making this deal with his pastor and also the gentleman who owned a pond behind the church to stock it with fish, as at that time, my dad and his friends started becoming serious competitive fishers and went in on a boat, which my dad had to sell his share to eventually to keep drinking. So my friends and I had permission to fish there in the summer, and we would go down and swim and all that. I lived easily less than five minutes from this pond, and my friends and I go out there one summer day. This was around 1995. My mom had heard on the news a week prior about a wave of kidnappings, and I don't remember if Amber Alerts were a thing then, so she decided to make a code word with me. She came to me and told me that if anyone ever tried to convince me that they knew my mom or dad in the hopes to get me in the car with them, is to ask them for a code word. And ours was pickles. So fast forward to our fishing trips, my friends leave before me after we sat around and actually just swam more than anything. My friend Dennis got mad because he was serious about fishing, so he and his brother left, and I was left on the road, as the road, once you got past this farm was a straight shot to the main part of the town, and our road was on the right just before the road ended. So, I get to my road, and as I am about to turn, I didn't notice that I was being followed by a beige-colored pickup with this Cletus-looking guy from The Simpsons in it. He greets me and tells me that my mom and dad were waiting for us at this local restaurant which I knew. He then tells me that they ask him to come and get me and meet them there so we can all have dinner. Immediately, I thought of what my mom said, and I started getting this evil feeling like I was in danger. 
So I told him that my parents specifically have a password that they give their friends. And that if he was their friend, he was required to tell me. At which point, he got mad and he started swearing at me, although I didn't see one, but I was certain that he had a gun as he started fumbling in the truck. I turned and I started pedaling down on my road screaming for help and that I was in danger. He jerked his truck to follow, but I was making too much noise and was already to my house that he just took off. When I got home, my mom was home and I was hysterical and asked her why she would ask such a mean friend to pick me up. I told her about what happened and she didn't believe me and she calmed me down and told me that I did the right thing. But I could tell that she had a hard time believing me. She also grew up in the same town, and nothing like that ever happened to her. A few days later, a friend of hers tell her a similar story about her son on another part of our town. The police then were involved, and the cops came and talked to me, and I gave them the same description of the man, the truck, and what happened and etc. I don't know if the guy was ever caught. I used to be very bitter at my mom for not believing me. But I now understand the confusion that she had. And instead of reacting, she just tried to console me and keep an eye on everything. My dad, on the other hand, was more vigilant about it and would ask me all the time when he would take me out if someone looked like that guy or if a truck looked the same as the one that I saw. I really do hope that no other kids were harmed by him. Back when I was a kid in school, I loved it. I always excelled in my classes. I was respectful to teachers and staff, and I had plenty of friends. During my senior year, I became a teacher's assistant, which basically helps with cleaning the room, organizing stuff, and since I was trusted enough, I helped with simple grading. This led me into tutoring other students, which made me realize that I wanted to be a teacher too. After high school, I went to school for secondary education with focus on English and math. I loved it. College was great, and starting as a teacher's aide, I knew that I wanted my own classroom. My dream came true when a local high school in the state I went to school in was hiring. Overall, my first year there wasn't too bad. Being a new teacher and first time at a high school, I think the kids tried to pick on me more, but I tried my best to show them that I wasn't the type to be taken advantage of. I must have done an okay job because they asked me if I planned on teaching next year. I didn't have anything bad happen or bad enough to make me change my mind and so I agreed to it. The second year, however, wasn't as good as the first. I saw some of my previous students moving up and seeing some of them excited to see me again was an amazing feeling too. This year, however... I was going to be teaching sophomores. From what I remembered in school and what I've witnessed there, you start to feel a bit more confident that you made it past your freshman year. So the kids become a little more arrogant, which means I had to be a little more strict with them. For the most part, it worked, but there was one kid that I always seemed to have a problem with no matter which way I approached them. I'll call him Kyle. Kyle was your typical loner. I noticed he didn't really hang out with many people. I've heard him in the halls in passing, talking to two other boys about pot or something, but acting like they were talking in code. They were horrible at it. Those two were the only ones that I ever saw him really interact with. Thankfully, I didn't have them in any of my classes though, just Kyle. I learned the reason for that was because Kyle was held back a year 
because of how much he missed the year prior, while his friends were then a junior. So while in my class, Kyle would come in late, and being the person I was, I allowed it a few times. When he started coming in and being disruptive, I started sending him back out to get a tardy slip. If you get too many of those, you are sent to a mandatory study hall, and if you skip that, you could face suspension. He started coming in on time, but instead of coming in quietly or just talking like the other kids do before class started, he would drag his chair across the ground to be as loud as possible, and then he would slam his backpack down, and then unzip it to slam down his math book on the table. Again, I would ignore it, until, as I would expect from young children, he would progressively get louder until he would get a reaction out of me. So, I sent him back to the principal's office, but he made sure everyone could hear it too. He was smacking lockers, kicking his backpack down the hall, just making as much noise as possible. Little things like this continued to happen for a few months, but he was called enough to the office that I had to have a meeting with the principal. Thankfully, the principal said that they've had issues with him before, and knew he was a problem student, but said if he ever became too much to handle, to let him know about it, and they will make arrangements. It was only my second year, but I didn't want to make it seem like I couldn't handle some teenagers, so I said that it wasn't really a problem, and I tried to move on. But Kyle seemed to be testing me though, to see how far he could take it, or maybe see if he could break me and I suppose I took this as a challenge. I started doing quick tests like writing a problem on the board and having two kids work it out, and the first one to finish would get a prize. After all of the students were trying and earning snacks and items, it seemed to get to Kyle, and he finally wanted to try. I was surprised, but I thought maybe it was a good way to level with him. Maybe he needed positive reinforcement. So, he went against another guy, and he just sat and stared at the problem for a while, writing something small to the side, trying to look over at the other kids. Of course, the other kid would end up finishing first, and in case it was wrong, I always make sure that both sides finish first. So, I had the kid cover up his answer by taping up a piece of paper, and that's when Kyle got mad the first time. He slammed the marker down, and I tried to reason with him. I tried to walk through the problem with him, and some snickered in the room. This set him off. He punched the whiteboard and turned around and yelled at the room, asking who laughed and started making threats. I tried to get him to calm down, and he just wouldn't. I told him to go out to the hall. I tried to make it clear that I wasn't sending him to the office, but just the hall to calm down. But instead of taking this as a second chance, he decided to start punching and kicking a locker. That's when I had to call the principal, but he got there before I could call and had him escorted out. From there, he was out for a few weeks and I just had to make packets for him. Surprisingly, I was actually getting work back. There were a lot of wrong answers but there was also a lot of scribbling on the sides, like he was actually trying. Being that I was the only teacher that taught this specific course, I was the only one that could actually help. So, trying to do the teacherly thing, I had a meeting with the principal, Kyle, and his mother, and I went to bat for him, explaining that I knew he was better than this, and that maybe he just needed tutoring. That way, there was less pressure. Kyle seemed indifferent at first, but his mom and the principal seemed really happy that I was willing to do so. So every Tuesday and Thursday, I would stay after school to specifically help him with tutoring. He tried to keep up the cocky appearance at first, but he started to ease up when he noticed that he wasn't getting a reaction out of me and there was no one else there to impress. 
The first few weeks were great. He really started coming around and was actually showing real improvement in his work. He actually was waiting outside my room when the day was over a few times, ready to work. I was ecstatic and the principal saw it too. One week, at the end of the tutoring session, he gave me a gift. He said it was to thank me for taking the time with him as no one else had before. It was a mug in the shape of an apple. I thanked him and I told him that that's what I was there for, to help all of my students. As he started leaving my room, he reached out his hand out to shake mine. Not thinking anything of it, I reached out to do the same. That was a mistake. He had pulled me closer and groped me. He was a large kid, as in he was super tall for his age and far from small, and at that time, I had a small frame and was barely five foot tall. I was able to push him away though, and I told him that he drew the line. He said that he thought that that was what I was going for, wanting to help him so much and be alone with him. I went off. I know, I still shouldn't have. But I told him that I was his teacher and that's it. I was there to help my students pass and that was it and I told him to leave. He walked out of the room backwards, staring at me the whole time. And once he was out of view, I went over and locked the door and called the principal to tell him what just happened. He called the cops and we had to file a report, but then I had to choose to press charges and I chose not to. I know it may have been stupid, but I didn't want to add to Kyle and his mom's problems. So again, he was out of class and this time, it seemed for good. I ended up getting a teacher's aide principal's choice and he helped me make the packets for Kyle. The rest of the school year was pretty uneventful. The kids seemed to have figured out that something happened and they were direct and to the point in my classes. This definitely wasn't a bad thing, but I did miss some of the joking and fun we had. However, towards the end of the school year, the finals had to be taken on site. We didn't have take-home computers at the time, so he had to come in in person. It would be after school hours, and I would not be alone with him. I gave my aide all the information in the packet he needed, and they took it in my classroom while I waited in the teacher's lounge. It seemed to go okay. My aide, James, told me that when he arrived, he seemed fine, but when he walked into the classroom, he seemed annoyed or angry. He sat there for a while before he started until James asked if he had a question. When he was done, he practically threw the papers at James, grabbed his backpack, and then stormed out the door. He started looking over the final, and that's when he called me and the principal to the room. James was to grade it, to make sure there was no bias or anything, but because of the content, he felt it was important to show me and the principal. Kyle seemed to have skipped through and answered the ones we worked on together, but the ones he did outside of class had random things written on them. He had profanity written all over it, Questions scribbled out or pictures, graphic pictures. He even made sure to label them as being me. Again, the principal took off to find him and instead found his backpack thrown in the trash bin at the door. The backpack was the worst part. Inside, it had a single five-subject notebook, a couple of pens and pencils that were broken and chewed on as well as a huge kitchen knife and a duct tape. We again had to call the police and his mom, and the worst part, he hadn't come home yet. I had to have a cop walk me to my car and follow me home. And that night, I cried. I was scared for myself because of this kid. He had intentions, and when it was just James in the room, his plans were ruined. I know he ended up going to a juvenile school thing, but it just freaked me out and I didn't want any label put on me, so I decided to quit. The principal assured me that he had no suspicion that I did anything wrong 
and said that I was welcome back, but I just couldn't. I went to an elementary school. There's a lot less fighting, or at least less fighting I can't control on my own. Never move in with a man or a woman that you've never personally known. I got a roommate from hell this way. That man tortured me psychologically when I turned his sexual advances down. He then stole thousands of dollars from me over time, even used my Amazon account to open up an account. He got some of my personal info, like social and etc. as well. Once I left after calling the cops to help me leave, he showed up at the Apple store I was at just a day after I left. Even though I left to go live on the streets, I had no family or friends as I was severely abused as a kid and I've been on my own since 14 actually, so I'm accustomed to surviving on the streets for periods of time. I was a million times happier than I ever was in his nice apartment, surrounded by nice things and a fancy car. I felt so relieved even just living in a concrete garage. I was a million times happier sleeping on concrete with a pillow made of a towel and a tiny blanket in the cold and heat than I ever was living there with him. He spent his time psychologically torturing me, and I don't regret leaving at all. He would bang on the wall across from mine every morning and late at night to startle me awake. He would throw pebbles or tap on my window in the middle of the night to scare me and then keep me on the edge. He'd give me weird little candies and teddy bears as if we were dating. He even ordered stalkerish love items from my own Amazon account. I mean, who the fuck spends this much on a Christmas ornament that says... I'll always love and follow you, or something along those lines. If I'd go to the restroom, he'd run and kick his foot at the door so loud and suddenly that it sounded like a door being kicked down. He would steal my items if I left them alone for even a second, so I'd have no way to go out if I had plans, then he would put them back once I mentioned them, or when it was too late for me to leave for my plans. This is one way he kept me home. If I got any mail or a package, he would interrogate me. He would say, What did you order? I need to know. Like he owned me or something. And towards the end, I was leaning doors and furniture up against the door because he picked my bedroom lock before while I was gone. And when I'd wake up sometimes, there was stuff missing or moved in odd ways so I know he was creeping around while I was asleep. He was an absolute freak, and I wouldn't put anything past him since he showed me how psychotic he was. If I was happy or in a good mood, he would start criticizing and nitpicking at my body, my hair, my face, my behavior, my voice, anything he thought I was insecure about. I even developed an ED because he always did this, and he mocked and laughed at me when I would make or eat food. Anytime I would leave my bedroom, he would rush out of his room to stand right behind or near me, like a weird little dog that follows you around panting. He would even piss in my hair products, my skincare products, and my vitamins. He would throw out food that I just bought, steal my cash, and even use my debit cards. He even ordered 30 to 40 plus items off my Amazon account without my knowledge or consent. It was the strangest thing. If anyone else had dealt with this, they'd go insane. I still have trouble believing this stuff happened as it was just so crazy to even think that someone is that crazy to do this. This happened a couple of years ago to me and two other friends, 21 and female. We were probably 17 at that time. It was summer, and we had plans to go to our friend's house. 
There is this park that is halfway from mine and hers. So my friends and I decided that it would be nice to sit in this hut in the park and have a smoke on the way to our friend's place. This was in the evening, so it was getting dark already. And time passed, and it was dark enough for the streetlights to turn on. It's important for the story to explain a bit on how the hut was situated in the park. The park was shaped like a big circle around a lake, so the hut we sat at had two entrances, from the left and right side. These entrances then connected to the main park path. The hut is open and just has bench seats in a circle and a roof, but open air if that makes sense. Anyways, the street lights on the right side were not working, so it was extremely dark on that side. My friends and I are chatting away, and the people are walking past like normal, nothing strange. Then this man comes from the left and is walking really slowly now. Normally, this wouldn't catch my attention, but it's the summer, remember? And he had a long, thick trench coat with a top hat that had a feather and sunglasses. He walked super slow into the dark and just stood there in the dark. I could make out his silhouette just standing there. At this point, all my friends are quiet as well, and we are feeling uneasy as we are all girls. Then the man begins to walk back towards the street light that has light on the left side. He then stands there for a couple of seconds, staring again. And then, he proceeded to walk slowly down the path to the hut, still staring at us. We thought maybe he would just walk through and wanted to scare us, but no. He then sits down in front of us and begins to talk. For context, we live in Brussels, so he started speaking French and said, What a lovely evening, ladies. We speak and understand French, but in that moment, we knew it was smarter to pretend that we don't, so we just say, uh, sorry, English. You can see him getting agitated and mad. He starts going on this whole rant about how we should speak the language of the country and stupid English people think that they are better than everyone else. As I said he was quite mad while saying all of this, I began saying to my friends that we should probably leave now as our friend is expecting us at her house soon. Since my other friends were so scared too, the minute that I said that, they said yes and started to walk the path to the main park, but they left their bags and everything, and I had to call them back, and they came back running, and while we are quickly gathering our things, he's just staring at us. We got our things, and then we started walking when we suddenly hear, Hey! Hey, come back here. We turn around to see him holding up the can of coke that my friend had left, and he said we should not litter and to come back and throw it away. We began to run at this moment and didn't look back. The whole way to my friend's house, we were so creeped out and scared that we thought he would follow us or something, and any person who walked behind us, we panicked. What scared us the most was he had his hands in his pocket the entire time, and the moment that he held up the coke can, there was something else in his hand that shined with the street light that none of us could make it out, but we assumed with the shape of the object and the way that it shined from the light, and also his behavior, and his hand in his pocket the whole time as well as he was calling for us to come back, we think that this guy had a knife. We have never seen that man since, and all of us refuse to go around that area at night now. It really scared us. I know this story might not be as creepy of an encounter as some of the other posts on here, but this has stuck with me and also my friends for a while that he has been named Hatman. We're not sure what that man would have done if we had stayed longer or had come back to throw the coke can out but I'm glad that we didn't find out. Be safe out there. You never know 
people's intentions. I'm quite an awkward person and I can struggle to make friends due to my shyness. So in late 2019 to early 2020, I decided to join my Six Forms D&D club. I was hooked and the fact that I had met a very lovely girl there who I'll refer to as May made it all the more enjoyable. It was the type of new friendship where all you want to do is spend time with your new bestie. And so, when May asked me to join their D&D party, I was overjoyed. I really did like her. She started off a little awkward, as was I, but she was really sweet and understanding, and we ended up having a lot of our more nerdy interests in common. The first time we hung out on our own was a lot more uncomfortable than I was expecting. Of course, as we had only been friends for a couple of weeks, so I knew it would be a little awkward, but I was not expecting how terribly unpleasant it turned out to be. We didn't seem to click for some reason. Everything was fine when we were in a group, but one-on-one, -on -one, May was... strange. She would completely ignore me for no reason all of a sudden, make very odd jokes but in a serious manner, leaving the pause a little too long, and would then laugh, as well as other strange mannerisms. That was just before I left sixth form early due to personal reasons. It wasn't super off-putting. I wanted to get closer to her, believing once she got used to me, maybe she would mellow out a little. But boy, I was so, so wrong. Once I did officially leave school, May became intense. It started out with her asking to meet up every to every other day, keeping in mind that I had started working full-time by this point and I had very little time to see people, which was fine because she'd understand that I was busy, right? Wrong. She started getting annoyed and upset to an inappropriate level. For example, she would make me send a picture of my calendar to prove that I was too busy to see her, and even when she could see that it was a chock-a-block, she would start to try and manipulate me and make me feel bad for not being able to see her. She would be messaging me things like, I love you, but you're so difficult to meet up with, calling me her best friend and telling me that she was crying because she couldn't see me. These conversations would happen around two to three times a week, and honestly, I started getting creeped out. By this point, we had only known each other for around two to three months, and we had met up alone around five to six times, and had seen each other almost every day at school before my departure. My creepometer had started to rise, but it wasn't at the point where I wanted to end the friendship. Sure, it was annoying of how possessive she was, but it's not like she was stalking me. Yet. I distanced myself from her a little, just for my own sanity, as her neediness had progressively gotten more intense and it had become taxing on my mental health. But I still wanted to be friends with her. Underneath everything, May really was lovely. But that was until... They came to my house for the first time, back when I was living with my parents. May turned up a lot later than we agreed, which peeved me a little as they know that I had work the next day, but it wasn't a biggie. And that's when the really uncomfortable comments started. Now, my parents' house is very nice. It's big. They have a gym and a hot tub, a lovely garden and etc. And by this point... I was used to my friends making a couple of comments like, Wow, your house is so nice. Or, Damn, I love your house. My favorite was probably when my cousin compared the house sizes to a horse, Dingling. Now, that's funny, but May, she wouldn't stop. 
She would drop how large or how nice she thought my house was in every other sentence, which later developed to her slating the house and my parents' job constantly, telling me that I was shoving my parents' wealth in her face, or that my parents got their money because they take advantage of vulnerable children. Please keep in mind that I had not spoken about my parents' money or the family home once in this conversation, because talking about private things like that is very uncomfortable to me. Then, she started to get even stranger, asking me to cuddle and spoon and telling me that I couldn't escape, going on about was I really happy with my boyfriend, then making jokes that didn't feel like jokes at my expense. I was very uneasy, and my parents could see it too. So after that day, I told me that I was way too busy to meet up, so to stop asking me. Well, she didn't. She started making jokes that because I wouldn't see her, she would just show up at my house and catch me off guard. She even changed her jog route, so she ran past my parents' house every day. She then started messaging my boyfriend. It was completely out of the blue. I hadn't even given her his social media or name. I hadn't even really discussed my relationship with her at all. He was very uncomfortable for everyone involved. And my boyfriend was obviously not interested in being her friend due to how uncomfortable she made me. She told him things like, You need my permission to date her because I'm her best friend. And you have to be friends with me and like me because I'm her best friend. We are not best friends. She would spam my phone with messages and I would reply around twice a month. I was completely smothered. It was so strange. But when I received the screenshot of their conversation from my boyfriend because he was creeped out, I was livid. The screenshot showed me them having a very one-sided conversation on her behalf, where all of a sudden, she told him that she loved him. I didn't know what to say, and neither did he, so I confronted her. May tried to turn it around on me and said, and I quote, <laughs> I was talking to your boyfriend, and he knew about me. Impossible. I figured out you talked about me without my consent. I'm heartbroken. It was surreal. I told her that I had mentioned that we met up and that she was a friend from school, which was true. And of course, I had told him that she made me uncomfortable, but she didn't know that, and the conversation ended there. Then she went to uni, and we didn't speak for a while. It was so relaxing. All the anxiety around the situation faded. May had made new friends, and I was free. But when she came home for Christmas, everything started up again, and all that anxiety came back. I was going through a really tough time, so me and my mom went away for a few days. But when I didn't respond to May for three days because I was busy, she went crazy. She spammed me on every social media that I have daily. Instagram, Snapchat, Discord, text messages, and more. The messages started off normally with her asking if we could meet up and that she was home from uni. But they gradually became angry, and I won't lie, it was scary. I believed her when she said that she would just show up at my house. And I was terrified that she'd ask my friends for my new address under the pretense that I had forgotten to give it to her, as they had threatened to do this in joking form before. It felt obsessive and I didn't know what to do. She wouldn't stop messaging me and it became a constant stream of creepy messages. So I exploded at her. I told her that this behavior was creepy, so I exploded at her. I told her that this behavior was creepy and that I have never been made to feel this uncomfortable by someone and that she didn't have boundaries and I was scared about the jokes disguised threats that she had made. I ended it off with the fact that I didn't want to see her again, and could she please stop messaging me? I could have definitely been nicer about it, but that never seemed to work in our prior conversations when I had to defend why I was busy 
and couldn't see her. Her response was so strange. She became incredibly apologetic and then got angry, then started to try and manipulate me into meeting up and then apologizing and putting herself down and then telling me that she loved me. I was so over all of her nonsense and weird behaviors. I felt bad for her and I had wanted to be her friend so much, but she was obsessive and overbearing and even though I tried for so long to make it work, she had ended up pushing me away because of her behavior. I do wish her well, and I hope she gets help for whatever is going on with her. But creepy stalker friend, you're definitely not my cup of tea. Please stay the heck away from me. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember... Your fear feeds me.